All right, how's everybody doing? Let's get this straight. Oh, glad I got such a turnout. I figured being the last speaker, you guys would be tired and sleepy by now, but uh, glad to see you. All right, so the talk I'm going to give today is on uh, BTCD, which is an uh, alternative implementation that we are working on at Conformal of the entire, uh, basically, uh, alternative to Bitcoin D. So it's a fully validating node, and it's written in Go. Uh, <clears throat> Talk about myself a little bit here first, uh, just kind of give you an idea of uh, who I am and what I've done. So I've been programming professionally for almost two decades and quite a few years before that as a, <laughs> as a child too, so kind of a teenager and everything. Um, I've done quite a bit of work in the open source community, I've contributed to OpenBSD. Some of you guys who use Go may be familiar with uh, Go Spew, which is uh, something that I came up with for dumping data structures in Go and uh, a lot of other projects I'm sure that uh, you may or may not be familiar with. Um, so I've uh, done work for the military as well. Uh, I've worked uh, a lot of uh, low-level proprietary assembler. And uh, I've also, uh, as part of Conformal, we worked on a, a, a zero-knowledge remote cryptographic solution. So basically it's a remote backup that's completely secured. And uh, distributed systems, databases. So basically, as you can see, pretty much all the components of Bitcoin <laughs> I've uh, worked on in one form or another over the years. So this was a really interesting project for me to come on board with, I think. Um, so right now, I'm a senior engineer at, at Conformal, as I mentioned, and I'm the lead developer on the project on BTCD. Um, so, you know, one of the first things I kind of wanted to go over is, you know, why does Bitcoin even need another implementation? I mean, Bitcoin D works, right? Why bother? Um, so, and, and I'll go over a little bit of uh, what BTCD is and why we decided to create it, some of our project goals, and, uh, then I want to kind of give you a live demo of uh, where we're at with it. So uh, some of you may have went to the State of the Union earlier, and I think you, you heard probably Gavin and Jeff talk a little bit about the fact that uh, you know, they actually do support multiple implementations. And one of the main reasons for that is that uh, you know, whenever you have a, a monoculture like you do with Bitcoin D, there are a couple of other implementations, but realistically, it's the only game in town. It pretty much controls the entire blockchain. And while the developers are, are doing a fantastic job, and you know, not mean to disparage them in any way, if they do have any bugs, or even they may not even do it on purpose, but as a you know, what happens over time, whenever people start working on things, they start to go in a certain direction almost without even knowing it. And so right now you have this situation where they can make changes to the protocol, the core developers, that can have pretty far-reaching implications, and there's not. Uh, if there's a bug, for example, the, the March 11th or March 12th chain fork that everybody's familiar with, basically that takes the entire blockchain down as opposed to just one single implementation. Uh, you know, if you uh, went to one of the lightning talks earlier, I believe the gentleman who works on bits of proof had mentioned that their client sailed right through the block fork with no problem. So if you expand that out and say we have 10 implementations of it, now, and you say, all your miners now, when they create blocks, they have to ask all these implementations, is this a valid block? Is this a valid block? If nine of them come back and say yes, one comes back and say no, majority wins, so the block is okay, but there's obviously a bug in one of those implementations. So the only people that are affected are, you know, assuming you had 10% equal users across all of them, the only people that are actually affected at that point are the 10% that are using that software and not the entire blockchain. And then most likely the people that are, are going to get notified pretty quickly because they're going to notice that their blockchain number isn't going up anywhere near as quickly as the rest because the hash power majority is going on the other chain while you have that 10% hash power only working on this alt chain. So it's going to become apparent very quickly that one of these alternate implementations has a bug in it. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that basically every successful internet protocol that's out there has some sort of human written spec. It either came first or it was developed later. You know, so RFCs basically, I'm sure everybody's familiar with them. Um, so some examples, I mean, everybody's going to be familiar with these. TCP IP, SSL and TLS, you've got HTTP, SMTP for mail, you've got IMAP for mail as well, DNS, the whole system, and even some non-protocol like HTML. You have multiple web browsers that are all going toward a common standard. And so, as you can see, all of these things run on multiple devices. They have multiple implementations by multiple independent teams, and they're all written to some standard, and everything works together extremely well. If you have any one implementation that has a problem in it, it doesn't affect the overall health of the network. So, 
in a, mainly our goal when we were getting started on this is that we want to make sure that we have full interoperability, obviously, that, that's a given. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's important, especially when we're very first coming out, that we basically match all the rules exactly, because if we don't, then we could be the cause of a blockchain on our own, and so, you know, that's uh, obviously extremely important to us. Uh, another thing that, uh, and I think you've, if you guys went to any of the other talks, I, I know in at least four of the presentations I watch people mention on it that uh, they're working on test coverage. Test coverage is extremely important when it comes to financial software. Uh, you know, I mean, you don't want to have a version release and all of a sudden you accidentally cause a regression that loses somebody some money, right? I mean, it's just, you, really, you really want high test coverage. Um, our goal has been, and, and we've released two packages, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we're aiming for 100% test coverage on everything we release. We definitely uh, take that extremely seriously. It's one of the biggest, uh, biggest factors in all everything we write. Um, the other big thing that we're focusing on is trying to create well-documented and easily readable code. Um, again, I'm not trying to put anything negative toward the Bitcoin D developers. They didn't even write it. But if anybody's actually gone and looked at that code, it's pretty hard to read. There's, uh, it's getting better, and, and there's been a lot of work in, in cleaning it up. But like the main C++ file, if you look at it, it's 5,000 lines of code. And uh, it's, uh, it takes uh, quite an effort to actually get in there and start understanding what everything is doing and, and how it's all going. Um, to contrast that, what we're aiming for is we're actually going for a package approach where every piece is a separate package that has a clean abstraction and documentation fully, uh, how this piece is used and how it integrates into the overall client. Um, the other big thing, again, that, that we, I've mentioned that we're using Go, it, it makes it pretty easy for the documentation. We can put our documentation in the code, in the comments, and the program GoDoc, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it actually generates user-facing documentation for you from those comments. And so as long as you're, you, know, you write a good overview and, and you actually focus on that as we are, you can have really good documentation come out of your code that's up to date because it's from the code, not separately maintained. Um, and then the other part I mentioned is by having separate packages, we can really focus on the fact that if somebody wants to write a website, for example, that, uh, process, that sees all the latest real-time transactions, they really don't need all of Bitcoin D. The only thing they really need is the ability to talk the wire protocol. So by having a separate package, which we've called BTC Wire, and I'll go over it in a minute, it only talks the wire protocol. So you can import that package, listen for transactions only, and you don't have the rest, you don't even have to download the blockchain or anything, right? It's just, I can listen specifically for that, if that's, you know, if, that's what you're after. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're we're going we're using Go, and some of the main reasons that we use this, and I realize that some of these are not only specific to Go, but as they all add together, it uh, is kind of unique to Go. Um, again, like I mentioned, uh, integrated test infrastructure. Test is huge to us. That's probably the number one thing we're after. So that was that was one of the big factors. Another one is that it compiles to native code. So even though we, for example, we have a, uh, our BTC wire, we had a gentleman on, the, on our IRC channel fire it up and try it on plan nine, and it worked right out of the box because the way that Go is, it all uses the standard library. But by, uh, you know, I know that things like Python and Java and all this can obviously do the same thing, but they're not native code, right? Java goes to byte codes, Python's interpreted, and so on. So the nice thing about Go is it's cross-platform in the same way, but it's also, you know, native code. Uh, another big thing, there's no active memory management in there. Again, Java and Python fit this bill as well, but they don't do native code. Um, right now, if you look at the C++ code, there's a whole lot of code that's dedicated specifically to all of your memory management, and it's really easy to mess up when you're dealing with multi-thread and concurrent programming. If you, you, know, you create some memory over here, you try to release it over here, but you mess up, and then you cause the whole thing to go down and crash. And I don't know if any of you have run into that, but uh, we've uh, certainly hit that on many occasions. Uh, another big thing as far as going to code readability, uh, a lot of times in, in programming there's kind of a holy wars over what style is correct. You know, is it uppercase, is it lowercase, is, there's all kinds of things that matter. What's really nice about Go that we like is there's a program called GoFump that it formats the source code and it's the authoritative source. That's it, right? There's no, no holy wars over what the right style is. GoFump is the right style, the end. Um, another, I just mentioned it's a, uh, Nice platform independent, kind of skipped ahead there. Uh, another great uh, thing that it has, that Go has, that I think is uh, also Erlang and, and uh, is another example of it that has it, is it has really good concurrency support. And I won't go too much into the difference between concurrency and parallelism, but 
what's nice is that one you know, concurrency enables the other. So by building this with a really strong concurrency primitives, it will make it easier in the future to break it out across multiple machines. Um, and due to the fact, like I said, it's basically, it's very crash resilient. It's very hard to crash Go programs because the number one causes of most crash are dereferencing null pointers, uh, freeing null memory, and things like this that you just can't do in Go. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we, it's really good built-in documentation facilities. So, you know, where are we at with it? Well, it's, it's still being actively developed, but we have a pretty much all of it, uh, you know, the, the core stuff done. We've got the discovery working where you can go and uh, talk to IRC or talk to DNS and get the, uh, you know, find nodes to when you very first come online, who are the other Bitcoin peers out there that I need to talk to. Um, we have the wire protocol wit written completely and released, and that's the BTC wire package. Um, we have all of the crypto hashing, base 58s, all the kind of key components of uh, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin uh, cryptography, even the ECDSA, which is what is used in the, uh, it's a cryptic curve cryptography. It's used uh, in the transactions to prove that the person sending the money is who they say they are. It's for their signatures. Uh, we, we have the peer-to-peer -peer manager, which handles connecting to multiple clients and so on. And another thing that we actually do that I think that Bitcoin D is still working on is we already have IPv6 support because Go kind of gives it to you for free. If you just use their connections, it, you, kinda, you just get it. Um, uh, we, we have the transaction script and execution going, and uh, that's a... Uh, there are still, that's one area where we're not 100% done on yet. We have the vast majority of the transactions going, but there are still a few that we're working out some bugs on. Um, and the other big piece that we have is the JSON RPC interface, which is, if, if you guys know, that's kind of how uh, QT and, and everything uh, work. They basically talk to the back end through JSON RPC. Um, I have an example, one of the things that we set up that is using BTCD in the background and uh, the JSON RPC interface to talk to it. And if I can figure out which one it was, I think it's this one. Yeah, so this is a block safari which we created. It's a, it was basically created in two days, so we know it's not very shiny, but uh, it was created just to you know, show off what, what the back end is. So we're not actually talking to Bitcoin D back here, we're talking to our BTCD daemon, and we're doing through that JSON RPC interface that we've actually already released to GitHub the code for that too, as well. And so, you know, it, it's basically like Block Explorer or Blockchain or any of the other ones that you've seen, just a, a very uh, quick version of it. But you can go through, look at all the, the various pieces of the blockchain, um, search a specific block number, and get the information on it. All right, so the, the two packages that were released, um, the first one that we released is actually the BTC wire, and, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it is specifically the wire protocol. I think that a lot of times when people are talking about protocol, they haven't quite uh, distinguished the fact that there's really broad categories to the protocol. The protocol is, there's the serialization, the, the actual data that goes in the format that it goes across the wire on. And then there's also the rest of it, which is the, the blockchain selection. Uh, what is a valid block? Which chain is right? What do we accept and what don't, what don't we accept? There's all that, the rest of it. And that's kind of the, the two broad categories. Um, when we first released BTC Wire, we actually had a few pe people comment on the fact that, well, this isn't a full node. We know. <laughs> We only released the wire portion so far, and we're working on the rest. Um, the current test coverage on that, as I mentioned, it's already 100% on the, the wire protocol portion. And the BTC JSON package that does the JSON RPC that I mentioned, it's uh, at 90% currently, and we're most likely by the end of next week, we should have that up to 100% as well. Uh, so the, the remaining packages, there's a few more than this, but this kind of just gives you a general idea of what we plan on doing. And I, I should back up and mention a little bit, like, rather than releasing uh, the entire BTCD right off the bat, we decided that we're going to release these packages as we get them to 100% test coverage or really close, and they're all polished, well documented, in pieces. This way the community can look at it and say, you know, see if they see any problems in each package as we come out with it, rather than here's a whole mountain of code, go through it and see what you think. It's like we can actually break it up, let people look at each one of these packages as we polish them up and get them ready. Um, so the, the next things that we're looking at is uh, the BTCDB, and what that layer is, is for us is, it acts as uh, the, basically the database layer into the, the blockchain. We've made a generic interface to it so that the back end can change. Um, right now we're using SQLite 
um, mainly because there aren't very many. Uh, uh, that's one of the, the downfalls of Go. It's kind of young, so there aren't a lot of options for databases that are mature, and SQLite seems to be the best choice right now. Um, but, that, but by providing that generic interface later on, if we want to change to level DB or any of the, anything else that's better, we can easily do that. Uh, another big piece that, we, that we're going to release is the BTC script. That handles all of the transaction scripts, verifying uh, signature keys, and uh, it's a little bit technical. I probably should, should uh, keep it a little more high level. But the idea is it, it handles all the scripting pieces of it. And then the chain piece is that second part of the protocol that I was talking about earlier that handles the what is the right block that goes into the chain. Uh, what's the, you know, what's the, is it, do we accept this or don't we accept it? It's all the rules, all the other rules that define what is correct and what isn't correct within the whole blockchain as a whole. And then finally, we actually have BTCD that ties everything together and gives you your, uh, you know, your peer-to-peer your -peer networking, address management, and eventually wallet and so on. Um, so just do a quick live demo here of BTCD. So what I have set up here, I actually have it in two different directories. On the top there, I'm running BTCD, and that's really not readable, is it? Well, can't see it, unfortunately. But on the top, what I'm doing is I'm running BTCD, and it's in listen mode. I have the configuration file set up, so it already is <laughs> configured for this uh, presentation. So uh, basically, this one, I've already downloaded the vast majority of the blockchain, and it's stored on my laptop here, and it's serving it up. In the bottom here, I'm also going to run BTCD but I'm telling it to connect to the other instance on the same machine. And so when you can see, it initialized it up. You probably can't, but I can read it for you. It, uh, you know, the RPC server's up. We're listening on a certain port. Uh, it started at block height zero, and then now it's actually starting to download the blocks. So in the last 10 seconds, it downloaded 8,503 of the first blocks, and that you know, verified them and validated them and everything and inserted into the, the back end database, and then we get the new block height. And so it's uh, doing the download now. Um, to show you the concurrency piece of it, open up Task Manager here. And so you can see it's uh, pretty equally, when it catches up here in a second, it's pretty equally distributed across both CPUs. All of the validation is all concurrent, and it's uh, happening through Go's concurrency pr primitives. And so we're, we're actually doing this across multiple CPUs. Um, as far as uh, what does the memory usage look like, got both of them here. It's right now, it's around seven and a half an 8 meg of usage. Now as the chain gets bigger and you start getting more toward the end of the blockchain and you have a whole lot more transactions, that generally goes to around 50 or 60 meg right now. But I think uh, as compared to Bitcoin D, I've seen it over 5 and 600 meg. So it's a little, little lower in that respect. Um, so that, that kind of covers the, the main portion of the live demo there. Another thing I kind of wanted to show here is that we put a lot of effort into actually making it so that other developers, that if they want to understand what's kind of going on under the hood, we put a lot of debug stuff in here. So I'm going to crank up the debug level on the bottom here and just put it to a log. And then I'll open up the log here in a second. Oops, I can't type. There we go. So it's spewing out a whole bunch of information here. So I'm going to stop that and then just open up that file. Okay, so kind of one of the neat things here that this is what I wanted to show is that when you start cranking up the debug level, when we do our protocol decoding, uh, you know, the, everything that comes across the wire, it's all binary and everything. So we actually decode that into these data structures. And we can dump, in the log here, we can actually dump those data structures. So when you can see that we sent a version message out, and you can actually see every single field of what is in that version message. And so Bitcoin D has a little bit of it in the log where they kind of give you a couple of fields and everything. But rather than just doing that, we actually show the, and we can, if you really want to dig in, and if for developers that need to see exactly what's going across the wire, uh, it actually breaks down every single field. So you can see every message and every, you know, timestamp, every field and every message and exactly how it's communicating and what the protocol looks like and exactly what's going across. And these are actually the blocks that were being advertised and so on. And I believe that is about it. I think I'm ready for questions. Let me see, make sure. Yep, that's it. I think so. So any, uh, any questions on any of this?
agriculture is uh, terrifying, and we need we need this. Uh, so thank you very much. Right. Um, I was a little disappointed to see SQLite in there because that's like the biggest piece of monoculture on the web. Everybody's got yeah. that in their web browser now. Um, also, uh, it won't work on Plan 9. That, I think right. the guy on IRC is a friend of mine, and he's going to be sad about that if he doesn't know that yet because uh, I think the C uh, library support is not there. Um, yeah, at the Plan 9 has to go yeah. disabled. So. <clears throat> um, we're, we're definitely actively looking for a different database we didn't really want to go with it, but like I said, unfortunately, that's the one negative part of Go. It's still young. There really are no mature database implementations. So, so, so the goal, though, is uh, is to have it be 100% pure Go and not have any yes, C Go. Yes, uh, absolutely. That is our, our final goal because it, it makes it a lot easier to port. I mean, like I said, with the the Plan 9 guy, none of us actually tried it on Plan 9. Uh, he he, one of the guy on the IRC just took it and within. I don't know how many, it was a few hours, I think, but he was actually already talking to other Bitcoin nodes on the live network yeah. through the protocol. Is this within. Mischief, I think? Uh, Who's that, I'm sorry? Mischief is his name? Maybe? Yeah, Mischief, yeah. 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 yeah, he was pretty excited about that, and uh, yeah. I, I don't know if he knows SQLite's involved yet. No, no. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're definitely uh, keenly aware that we want to get rid of that depth at some point. Uh, and it, there's actually a, a level DB implementation under work that's actually under development right now for Go, and once it's up to a a level that it's, you know it's mature enough for financial software. That's most likely what we'll go with. But for awesome. now, right on. Well, thank you again. All right. Hi. Um. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was wondering if this would work with um, uh, on ARM. Yeah. So Go actually does work on ARM. The one thing that might be the issue is. Uh, it, SQLite, whether or not the, the, the CGO is enabled on the ARM port. But it should definitely, I know for the vast majority of it, definitely works on the packages. Anything that's native Go works on ARM for sure. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, just to follow up on the database question, uh, I'm not familiar with LevelDB, but um, could you maybe speak to uh, the kind of database that would be best suited to the application, like, you know, relational or non relational or SQL or non SQL? Mongo, maybe something like that. Right. Okay. So, I mean, honestly, the biggest issue with, with the blockchain as far as the database is concerned is uh, the, the number of transactions gets really, really large in a kind of bottlenecks databases. In fact, we had to put quite a bit of effort into optimizing it so that SQLite didn't choke the whole machine down. We were pumping the data into it so fast at first that the whole machine would come to a grind because the hard drive couldn't keep up. It was just too much I.O. So it took a, it took a bit of a tweak into, to solve that issue. But the, the main, the, the key component of it, I think, is that it, the database needs to be able to handle very large number of transactions. Uh, you know, we're already at 18 million, and it's just going to exponentially get more and more transactions. Uh, so I think that's, without a doubt, the, the biggest key point. If you talk relational versus not, I'm more of a fan of relational databases just because I, I really don't like the eventually consistent model. It's okay when you're on a single machine, but you know, at some point, I firmly believe that the blockchain is actually probably going to have to be split up between multiple machines because you're going to require a supercomputer to run it at some point. It just, you know, it's the, the scaling of Bitcoin. I think everybody's familiar with the fact that at some point <laughs> you, you can't run it on a single computer anymore. And I think once that happens, eventual consistency in a financial database is potentially an issue you know you don't you want to make sure that once you've inserted a transaction that it is in fact there uh, you know you don't if if not when you start talking about sharding and and you get back a response it's like okay it's written but it's really not yet and then things go down and it didn't get propagated there, there's some potential issues there so I'm a fan of relational in that regard there's definitely room for debate there anybody else Um, yeah, sure. So I think uh, one of our other developers, uh, David Hill, actually, originally we, were, we, we have our own operating system based on OpenBSD called Bitrig, and David Hill was actually doing the port, and he's done quite a few ports. Um, so he ran into a lot of non-portable bits almost instantly to the point that uh, we, we eventually gave up on porting it over there to Bitrig. Um, so, but the, you know, it, it's actually pretty solid code when you, when you get down to it. Uh, the very... Uh, 
real well written from an academic standpoint. I think that the biggest issue that, that we've encountered with it is that, as I mentioned earlier, it's really quite hard to follow. It's a very high entry barrier. And, you know, an average person who's not really, really adept at C++ really can't just dive into the code and get started. Uh, it, the, the abstractions really aren't there. It's all very tightly coupled and integrated. And so you can't just take a piece of it out and use it. It's, you know, you, you have to, everything is all together, and if you open up, like I said, the main file, there's 5,000 lines, and everything kind of, this one calls that one, which calls that one, it's almost spaghetti code, really, is kind of what it is. Um, so, I really think that that was the most challenging part, is just kind of wrapping our heads around the fact that there's, you know, that uh, there's very little documentation in any of the code, and there, it's just uh, very hard to follow, because there aren't any abstractions. And, and everything it has to be, in addition, you know, obviously everything has to match perfectly too. So we really had to dig in and make sure what are the exact rules that it's following. And even in some cases, we had we put some uh, notes in our code where we said that, you know, technically this is probably a bug, but it's what Bitcoin D does, so we're going to do it too, right? <laughs> there, there are some comments you'll find in there that are like, uh, okay, this is wrong, this is a bug, but we're making sure we're compatible, so let's follow suit. Um, three questions here. Uh, okay. One is, how big is your team working on this? Um, so we have uh, four main developers working on it. Okay, and how quickly are you guys anticipating um, tracking the reference implementation as they make changes? So, uh, you know, obviously that's a, that's a big factor. We plan to keep up with it within a few days for sure. I mean, as okay. much as, obviously if it's a huge thing that we can't, but we do want to stay as close as possible to it, yes. Okay, and the last question is, is um, Conformo planning to use this in like their own product or can you speak to like what your internal plans are with the engine? Uh, maybe one of the guys in the back can. I, I can't, no. Okay. There are some, some plans I know, but uh, I'm not at liberty to discuss, so. Is that it? All right, thank you everyone, appreciate it.